Hello, my name is Todd Green, and I am the Executive Director of WorkRise, a research to action network on jobs and workers and mobility. And we're based here at the Urban Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you today to Practitioner Talks, a quarterly speaker series that highlights perspectives of leaders in policy, advocacy, and business who are shaping economic opportunity and mobility in the labor market. First, I'll just share a couple of housekeeping items. This event today is being recorded and we'll post the recording online afterwards. We've, we have closed captions turned on and if you'd like to adjust your settings, click the button at the bottom of the screen. Finally, we encourage you to add questions or comments in the Q&A box at any time. But because of the limited time we have today, we may not have time to answer them all in real time, but we'll certainly follow up. We have the pleasure of co-hosting today's event with the Aspen Business and Society Program. Through carefully designed networks and working groups and focused dialogue, this program identifies and inspires entrepreneurs to challenge conventional ideas about capitalism and markets and to test new measures of business success. They've just launched a new economic mobility accelerator, uh, a new project that supports uh, corporate teams in scaling up projects that drive business value and enhance economic mobility for low wage workers. Projects like the Accelerator are a reminder that there is a greater appetite among businesses to be part of the solution. Since the early 1980s, workers, particularly those without college degrees, they faced declines in both earnings and mobility. These workers are increasingly shut out of jobs that offer family sustaining wages and benefits and opportunities for career growth and for advancement. A confluence of recent events, the pandemic, George Floyd's murder, and the movement for racial justice has awakened a sense of uh, among employers that they have an active role in expanding access to good jobs and economic opportunity. When we approached our colleagues at Aspen about a business leader who is deeply engaged on issues of economic mobility and opportunity for low wage workers, Nina Potenza immediately came to mind. Nina is a manager of people and culture uh, strategic initiatives at Inca Group, which operates more than 350 IKEA stores in 32 countries around the world. So as you'll learn today, Nina is, she's very passionate about her coworkers and she's committed to cultivating a workplace culture that is based on trust, empowerment and engagement. She's a veteran human resources leader that began her career with IKEA more than 25 years ago uh, in the United Kingdom. So I'm thrilled to welcome Nina Potenza to Zoom. Hello, Todd, delighted to be here and thank you so much. It's great to, to have you. So let's just dive right in. So I'd like to start by asking you to explain a little bit more about what your role is at the Inga Group and what you and other talent managers, what have you learned from employers, uh, employees rather, and from coworkers during this time of really unprecedented change? Oh, absolutely, Todd, so thank you again. Um, so let's start with, you know, with over 170,000 coworkers spanning 32 different markets, uh, what I do is I lead development work that really contributes to improving the everyday coworker experience. Uh, very much in line then with our people strategy, but of course, delivering both to our, our business growth uh, and our ambitions. So uh, very exciting times uh, we are in right now. Um, and then I think it's important to understand that, you know, the majority of our coworkers, they work in our stores and our warehouses. So frontline workers for us are front and center. And really, during this unprecedented time of change, we continue to see that our co-workers, as, as we call them, they, they truly are our superheroes. The, the resilience and, and the adaptability to change is just constant. And, and one of the learnings we've had is when we stand strong then in, in our company culture, when we remove some of those small barriers uh, unnecessary structures, then we can really unlock potential. We've also learned, you know, solutions and ideas, they sit with many, not just with the few. And that when we can really create an environment of, of both psychological safety, 
trust, collaboration, then we can actually enable everybody to, to test, try, fail, sometimes learn, and then adjust. So I'll, I'll get into some more of those details as we continue talking together, Todd. Well, I, I, I absolutely love that word co-worker and the approach that everyone uh, at IKEA is a co-worker. So, uh, but I, I do want to maybe get into the retail industry. Certainly uh, the retail industry has experienced so many significant shifts, consumer demand uh, over the pandemic. And so we've had online shopping and hybrid shopping experiences. Uh, that's certainly accelerated. And then workers who've had to face uh, more exposure to COVID. So can you talk a, a little bit about the ways that IKEA has had to pivot and how you've adapted to uh, your business model to be more responsive to uh, the consumers while at the same time as caring for your employees' health and safety? Mm, absolutely. So, so let me share um, a little bit of a story and, and some examples here. Um, and I just want to home in a little bit back on that co-worker experience where because we really want people to both thrive, feel included, and, and actually learn every day. And I think, uh, you know, with the great challenges that we're facing right now and opportunities in a very fast uh, transforming world, this puts uh, priorities and responsibilities with us. So when the pandemic first hit, it was really important for us to secure the health and safety of our customers and our coworkers. And in that, we really wanted to secure the basics first to create that level of stability. So we started with income stability and our core benefits stability. We also supported maybe some of our more vulnerable coworkers that needed that extra support. Then at the same time, what we found is we really had to um, give our leaders an incredible amount of resilience training, not only for themselves, but that so they could build resilience for many more others, and a lot of efforts on mental well being, health, uh, etc. So then by doing that, and really trying to sort of stabilize the situation, what we were then able to do is really go all in on pivoting the business. And I think this was an incredible uh, period for IKEA. And I wanted to just give you actually a couple of examples of what pivoting meant for us. Please. Um, so if just to sort of have that reality, 75% of our stores are actually closed at the peak time. Oh. Then they reopened, closed again. So this constant pivoting was occurring and more, more than half of the volume that we normally ship was suddenly being shipped from our stores, uh, whereas previously they'd gone from distribution centers because we very quickly had to activate click and collect as that concept to really not just enable consumers to keep buying, but very much respecting health and safety in the situation that we were in. So click and collect together with thousands more um, neighborhood pickup points were very quickly activated. And then we still have today more than 80 different projects where we're really trying to improve the store fulfillment capabilities. For example, using like robotics, uh, automation, even drones. So when you start to hear some of that pivoting, you can imagine that led, led to an incredible amount of upskilling, reskilling that needed to happen. And we, we later have been able to calculate 65,000 of those 175,000 co-workers were actually immediately multi-skilled. Mm -hmm. so if you think about our restaurants having to close and redirecting those resources to be able to fulfill our customer orders was incredible. And even 6,000 of our customer support center co-workers, they were suddenly being multi-skilled to remote selling and becoming home furnishing specialists online. So when you think about all this amount of pivoting that was happening, one thing, and I really want to stress this, there's a few things that really didn't change for us. And that is staying truly strong to our company culture. Because when everything is pivoting and changing around you, what do you ground yourself in? And that was our culture, which really guides us during this change. And we fundamentally believe that as I talked about thriving and inclusion and learning before, that will continue to actually be our future as we continue to develop and pivot. So I think some of those examples give you an idea of what we were actually faced with. 
Yeah, and I just, I'll just take a moment to say uh, that I just hadn't thought about in particularly in that environment about how your coworkers were able to acquire additional skill sets that really uh, can propel uh, their opportunities for mobility. Uh, I, I love that opportunity around up, upskilling. And I also think that this aspect of culture, that's a, that's a really uh, important one that I think is really worth underscoring about how that allow you to make that pivot more seamlessly with, um, with your uh, coworkers. And, and maybe my next question is, it's kind of really related to that in picking up where we just left off. And, uh, and it's, it's really around what we've been seeing in the labor market where the long-term trend, and this has been true for many years, where there've been fewer pathways for advancement for workers and particularly those without a college degree. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on how you and maybe other HR leaders that you have exposure to, how are you thinking about advancement for hourly and non-managerial workers and and then how does your company think about this in the context of dignity and purpose and respect? All of these qualities that we know are really important to making for a, 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 a good job and a job that's worth having. And I think this is a super uh, important question to, to continue to dialogue together on. Um, what I'd like to do is actually maybe just build from what we shared a little bit in the last question, because what we have done is very much put our focus on this element of thriving, inclusion and learning. We're going beyond some of those basic elements. So I'd like to start a little bit with what we believe thriving uh, is to us. And it's, we have very much focused on creating a, a really great coworker experience every day. You know, we want to make life easier for our many coworkers so that they can actually put their energy into meeting the customer take away some of those small annoyances so that you can really focus in on that customer experience because that actually is what develops individuals but it also develops us as a business and that's really important so it's about focusing on creating really good quality jobs jobs that can also provide more flexibility in the hours especially in the retail world but also around fair wages so to really create some uh, uh, stability in that field but then another thing that is really important for us around advancement and advancement of particularly, like you said, uh, Todd, hourly and the non-managerial workers, we have a concept mm -hmm. uh, within IKEA that I'd like to just share a little bit with you called Leadership by All. Now, it might sound a bit radical, um, but it's actually rooted very deeply in our company culture and values. And basically what we're saying in a very simple way is that we can all lead. All 174,000 of our co-workers can lead. And it's very much the idea, you could say, that a small group of managers taking decisions in a very centralized way no longer works. That it is actually the empowerment and the advancement and the engagement of all of us. Um, it's the idea that every individual has the potential to lead, lead and develop the business together, no exception. But in achieving this, we need managers to let go of control. Okay. We need managers to let co-workers make decisions, delegate responsibilities and tasks, but at the same time, support, guide, listen, and coach. So in, in, you know, to summarize this, it's very much like sort of values-based shared leadership. And it's really in a very simple IKEA words, it's the idea that leadership is actually not a position, but it's a mindset that can actually be adopted by many more. Um, and I wanted to actually give you an example of a manager we have called Andy in Norway, because he has been a bit revolutionary uh, around this. So he uh, actually got a new leadership role. He had a team of about 20 or so co-workers. And one of the big problems he was facing from the beginning is this unbalanced workload. You know, how to distribute workload in a, in a way to actually stimulate performance uh, and engagement. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in really taking on the concept of, of leadership by all, every morning in a very simple and natural way, mm -hmm. the co-workers together assign their tasks to themselves. They appoint an informal leader and they then secure an equal distribution of balance of work. And very much what Andy then does is allow those coworkers to lead themselves, 
coaching, supporting, guiding, and facilitating as necessary. So when we talk about true advancement, we talk about many things around purpose, around quality like that. So I think that's really important. Yeah. Then at the same... Mm -hmm. go, please go oh, ahead. Sorry, Todd, I've got a, just a couple more examples I wanted to share because that's very much around thriving. Then we've also really focused in a lot around an inclus inclusiveness uh, mm -hmm. as a concept. And I think we really see inclusion as an enablement of advancement in the workplace. And just to share with you a couple of, of points here, and you know what, we've, we've made incredible progress. We've still got work to do, but I think it's uh, with, with a little bit of pride, I would like to share here, you know, 50% 50, 50 of our managers today are women and 48% of all our country boards are made up of women as well. But most importantly, our talent pipeline for key positions also has that gender balance now anchored. And 87% of our managers actually grow from within the company. Hmm. So all these efforts are building advancement, are really stimulating us to help many more people grow. Um, so yeah, just a couple of examples to share with you on that. Yeah, um, thank you for, for that. You, you shared so much and um, I, I can spend a fair amount of time unpacking here, but, I, but maybe um, as I reflect on this, what this means for IKEA and for uh, Inca and how you've been able to be successful, uh, how your business model, uh, one, one point that, that was just so interesting to me about what you just shared was this focus on thriving. Uh, and how your model has allowed you to have a focus on thriving, when in reality, we know that a lot of businesses are not focused on thriving, that they've had to focus on surviving. And it's just uh, incredible to me to hear how your coworkers are involved in that journey with you and how they're contributing. Uh, and, and thank you for sharing that story about Andy. That that's, he sounds like a pretty impressive uh, person there uh, in, in terms of leading that. The, the other kind of uh, aspect that was very interesting to me had to do with this aspect about inclusiveness mm -hmm. and how that actually supports uh, your business success and uh, reverber reverberates to your uh, bottom line in, in other ways. So, so many employers that I talk to, they're, they're being challenged now about how do we find workers and how are we managing with that? And I think that uh, a lot of the strategies that you just discussed about making uh, your coworkers uh, feel empowered. I think that's that's. I think that that's just really powerful and and really can be instructive to to others as we move into maybe a new normal in the labor market and mm -hmm. and see how things are are working a little differently. Right. And, and let me just maybe use this as an opportunity to build on another uh, point here. And that that's you've talked a bit about how your employers are 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 they have. They have an opportunity to express themselves and, and you take that seriously. I love this idea, I wrote it down, leadership by all, right? That's a, that's a phenomenal topic. So this, this idea of worker voice and providing meaningful channels for workers to have input, it's emerged as a powerful theme in a, a lot of public debates. And you've talked a bit about this, but I'm curious if you can expand on this. How have your workers' voices incorporated and some of the practices that you already described today. Mm. No, I think this is um, a very important uh, question uh, again, Todd. And I think voices, worker voices, and truly listening and activating ourselves is uh, is an important part of our everyday. Um, maybe what I could do is talk a little bit about the, the formal perspective and maybe more the informal perspective, because I think formally, we, uh, in many of our practices, we are always trying to um, bring our voices out of the many people. So if I give you a couple of examples, we have what, what one might say the more traditional ways of doing that through surveys. We have an annual co-worker survey where we really are asking our many, many co-workers to tell us about their daily experience with, with IKEA. We also can trigger pulse surveys. So let's say, for example, we've recently redone the co-worker restaurant in one of our stores. 
And we want to understand from our coworkers, you know, what is it like? What is the food like? What's the experience yeah. like? We can trigger those kind of surveys so that we can get really fast, instant feedback, but that you also, your voice feels heard. Um, also, what we've tried now, something, uh, something new now in uh, the year 2021, which feels so far away, is we actually introduced what we call a, a new uh, survey focus uh, called Inca Includes. Um, and this was really important for us because it's actually all about inclusion. Um, and the survey was designed to measure the demographic diversity uh, of our workforce and, workforce and to hear directly from our coworkers, how they identified themselves, but also how they perceive fairness and inclusion in the workplace. And, all these kind of surveys are important, but what's as important is the action we take from them, the improvement measures that we actually do. We have, for example, also in more real time, and I think this is important, we've introduced this thinking around co-worker journeys. So what are the most, what are those moments that matter most in important co-worker journeys so we can get instant feedback and then we can improve. So if we take, for example, the onboarding journey, a, a traditional sort of people process, mm -hmm. in those moments that matter in the onboarding journey, let's capture the feedback in the moment, let's understand what the experience was like, and then let's make immediate improvements. We've also working hard with um, what we call co-worker reference groups, this is very much bringing co-workers together about very specific topics or themes where they can learn, dialogue, experience, challenge uh, and debate, but where it's a safe environment where we truly are listening. And then I think, you know, what's really important in all of these sort of formal practices, mm -hmm. um, and again, very much grounded in, in our culture and values is this everyday dialogue. The everyday dialogue, not just between each other as peers, but between, you know, manager and co-worker. How is an environment created where that dialogue can happen because there's enough trust built into the relationship? So that daily dialogue will never go away with the formal mechanisms that we have, but it becomes a very important part of creating not just the culture we want, but really building let's say openness, honesty, transparency, and, and trust together. Um, uh, so interesting ab uh, about that. And you, one would think that this is uh, some of these traditional approaches. You talked about surveys. And I think that so many employers actually undertake surveys, but I'm really impressed about how you actually do something with the surveys and that it seems uh, to have a lot of immediacy immediacy and the engagement, I think, is really phenomenal. Uh, there's so much I want to unpack in, in that question, but I want to make sure that I at least get to some audience or at least an audience question. So I have one here around um, how do you undertake this shared leadership approach, but not um, overburden um, staff members who are focused on, on this task? So there's a lot about listening and talking and, and you know, that takes time. So how, how are you able to manage that um, and make people feel comfortable and not overburdened and still meet your goals? Yeah, no, I think it's a fabulous question. And, you know, time is one of those very, very core elements of, of the everyday workplace. I think um, a lot of it is about really dialoguing and talking together, really enabling our leaders not only to go through their own development, but really seeing their coworkers as a resource for learning, finding solutions together, having ideas. So to take on the tasks in a very, very sort of team focused way. And then we don't really get so much burdened about the differences of our roles, but we see more of the collective team together. Yeah, okay, interesting. So uh, I think I have time for just one more uh, uh, question from the audience and it, it's about how do you recommend companies move forward toward giving leadership uh, decisions about making uh, the, the leadership decisions, making capability to those uh, not in executive roles, especially when that behavior is not ingrained in the organizational culture already. Yeah, I think it's a super tricky 
um, uh, process to go through. And I'm not saying uh, by any stretch that we are we are there. What, uh, but what we have is a mindset and we have a true mindset that every individual has a huge potential to contribute. They sit with the ideas, they sit with the solutions, they sit with the capabilities to actually enhance the business, not just themselves, but the business as well. So what we, what is really important for us is to really understand what is the role of a manager Mm -hmm. within IKEA to be really clear about that and to then enable our leaders in their own development to explore what does that mean to them. So what is leadership by example at IKEA and how do we share that and how do we actually train our leaders to be able to demonstrate those behaviors that we want to see. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us today and this the time has gone by very quickly so uh, thank you for uh, this joining us, Nina, in this practitioner talk. Uh, and I also want to thank the Inca Group as well as to our co-hosts, uh, the Aspen Business and Society Program. And I'd like to thank all of you for attending this today. And we look forward to seeing you at our ne next practitioner talk uh, and to joining us at many of the other Aspen Business and Society events and our work rise events. Uh, now we've dropped uh, some of these links into the chat, uh, which you can where you can learn about uh, uh, these events, and you can also visit our website and subscribe to our newsletters as well. So have a wonderful rest of the day, and big thanks again, Nina. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank Bye you. Now.